Hello, and welcome to the FrogWatch USA mapping tutorial. This web-based tutorial is a step-by-step -step orientation for anyone interested in frogs and toads to explore the FrogWatch USA data and create a map. Use maps to discover what kind of species are found in your state, where else those species have been observed by other FrogWatch USA volunteers, what type of wetland habitats are used by a species, and more. FrogWatch USA's mapping system is powered by FieldScope, an online data entry, mapping, and analysis platform developed by National Geographic Education specifically for citizen science programs like FrogWatch USA. The FrogWatch USA mapping tutorial will take you approximately 15 minutes to complete. You can start, stop, and return as often as needed. Let's begin by navigating to the FrogWatch FieldScope homepage. To begin mapping, we will click the Map Data button and are directed to the mapping homepage. Here you can explore starter maps, which are separated under the Explore Ecology and Navigate Neighborhoods tabs, or you can create your own map from scratch. One use of FrogWatch USA data is describing the presence and geographic ranges of frog and toad species. Let's find out where volunteers have heard spring peepers calling in a full chorus. You can either look at the starter map titled Species Range Map Spring Peeper Example or follow this tutorial to create one from scratch. Let's begin by clicking the Create Your Own Map link. On this page, you'll be able to select one of eight base maps. Each base map has different benefits for displaying data, so be sure to read their descriptions when creating your own. For instance, the gray map has only state lines and may be useful if you don't want your map cluttered with too much information. The National Geographic base map with wetlands is the default used in data entry because it can help you locate your site. Today, we are going to pick the National Geographic base map without the built-in wetland layer so we can have more control of our layers in later steps. To move to the next step of mapping, you can either use the Next button or the Step tabs. FieldScope does not require you to follow any order when mapping, so it is possible to change between these four tabs as often as you'd like and go back and make changes after completing a map. For this tutorial, we are going to use the Next button. In this tab, you can select and filter your data. Currently, FrogWatch USA is the only data source available, but others may be added in the future. Filters change the scope of the data on your map. Four filter categories are available. You can use Filter by Value to show only data associated with groups within a variable, Filter by Area to show only data from sites within a defined area, such as a state, filter by date to show only data within a range of dates, and filter by observer to show only observations by a particular group, such as a chapter. Multiple filters can be combined. For our map, we're going to use filter by value to create a spring peeper filter. First, we must select species as our data variable and search for our species of interest, the spring peeper. We'll use the arrow buttons to select the spring peeper and its subspecies, which can all be found under spring peeper. It is possible to change the name of your filter, but we are going to leave it as the default suggested by FieldScope and add our filter. Our map will now only display observations where spring peepers have been heard calling by FrogWatch USA volunteers. We only want to display observations where the species is calling in a full chorus, however, so we must add another filter. To do this, let's filter by value again. But this time, select call intensity as our data variable, and then choose three, full chorus. Now we must ensure that our filters are combining properly by deciding if we want the filters to match as 
any selected filters or all selected filters. Field scope defaults to any selected filters, which will include any data from either filter. This means that right now it will include all observations where spring peepers were reported as calling and all observations where any species was reported as calling in a full chorus. We want to use the other option, all selected filters, which will only include observations that fit both of our criteria, that the species calling must be a spring peeper and the spring peeper must be calling in a full chorus. When making your own map, always keep in mind how your filters should combine. We are now ready to move to the next step of mapping. In this stage, we are no longer changing which observations are displayed, but how they are displayed. Currently, the only option in the Data Observation Using dropdown is Frogwatch USA. In the future, you will be able to convey additional information about your site or observation using size or color differences in the icons. Under Display Count As, we want to leave the default of Observations selected. With this setting, numbers on our map will reference how many times a chorus of spring peepers was heard in that state. Alternatively, the count could be displayed by selecting Number of Stations and would show the number of sites where spring peepers have been heard. You can also choose to have no numbers at all on your map. Finally, we can pick which variables should be displayed in our data table using the Displayed Variables section. By default, 23 variables are included in the table. Changing the data table does not change the map, but a large data table can make it difficult to interpret the map results. Here we can remove some irrelevant variables, such as directions to site, because they are too specific to be of interest to us. When you make your own map, you can remove as many variables as you would like. Now that we have customized the data display, we can choose the data layers in the next section. You can add up to two layers to your map. Each uses external data to make your map more informative. For our map today, we are going to select parks and wetlands. You can change how the layers are stacked under the selected layers section. Now that we have selected our filters, data display, and layers, we are ready to view our map. Here, we are prompted to learn to use our map, which we will skip for this tutorial. Depending on the amount of data being displayed, your map may take a few moments to load. But now, we have our map. First, let's open the legend to learn what the color coding means. Each frog icon represents the location where a chorus of spring peepers was heard with the associated number of observations. You can zoom into the map using either the scroll wheel on your mouse or by clicking the plus or minus sign below the magnifying glass. Additionally, you can zoom quickly by holding down the shift key and drawing a box around the area of interest. As you zoom in, more frog icons will appear to depict the observation locations at a finer scale. We can also control layers using the Map Layers tool in the left-hand toolbar. The eye allows us to quickly make layers invisible, and we can change how each layer appears using the Transparency tool. These features can be used if the layer you selected covers up important information such as street names and state boundaries. It is also possible to toggle the visibility of layers with the comparison tools in the left-hand toolbar. You can choose either swipe or fade tools. First, let's explore the swipe tool. Swiping allows us to compare the two layers by moving the red divider line across the screen. Here, the wetlands layer is on the left, and the parks layer is on the right. We can also use the fade tool, 
which allows us to fade the top layer in and out by changing the transparency. The filters and data query tools let you add or remove filters without navigating away from the map. And the draw tool will allow you to add things such as shapes, text, and measurements to your map. These will stay on your map when saved, so they can be helpful if you are pre-creating a map to be used for educational purposes and for sharing with others. Now, let's explore the information included in the map. We can click on any frog icon to view the corresponding data. This prompts field scope to combine the map and data table and highlight the site's information. You can also combine the data table and map by checking both of their corresponding boxes. Here, the data is depicted in a spreadsheet. This table has some built-in features that let us explore the data. For instance, you can click on the title of any column and the table will sort alphabetically or numerically based on that column. Additionally, the count button depicts details of the data, including information such as the count, sum, average, minimum, and maximum of numerical data. We can export the data table as a .csv file, which can be viewed with any program that reads spreadsheets, such as Microsoft Excel. You can split the map and data table by deselecting the box of the page you no longer want to view. Finally, to save the map, we must name it. Let's name this Tutorial Map. You can choose to click Share this map with other FieldScope users and FieldScope will include the map in a stream on the right-hand side of the Mapping Home page. You are encouraged to share any map that may be of interest to other FrogWatch FieldScope users. Clicking Save will now save the title and description. And to save this map, we'll click the disk symbol. And it will reload exactly as you have it now, including any changes in the zoom or drawn symbols that you have included. If you want to view this map in the future with the most recent observations, you will have to refresh the map. Thank you for completing the mapping section of the FrogWatch FieldScope tutorial. We hope you enjoyed learning about the mapping tools and continue to explore and learn many of its exciting features. Additional tutorial information accompanies each of the starter maps.